A modest proposal for court reform with Stephen Gregory of the Gregory Law Firm. That is our topic for today. Welcome to the Lawyers and Mediators International Show and Podcast, where we discuss law and conflict resolution topics to educate both professionals and everyday people. Catch regular episodes on YouTube and anywhere you get your podcasts. Just remember, nothing in these episodes constitutes legal advice. So be sure to talk to a lawyer as cases are fact dependent. Hey, welcome back, everybody. This is Mac Pierre Louis, attorney, mediator, arbitrator, working throughout Florida and Texas. And uh, welcome back to the show. It's been a while. I've uh, been a little, bit, a little bit of a hiatus, but I'm glad to be back to talk with more interesting people with interesting things to tell. And one of which is Mr. Stephen Gregory on your screen. He's an attorney like me and a mediator like me and an arbitrator as well. And so, Stephen, you have been a lawyer for, I believe, three decades. And so you've basically done it all, lots of mediations under your belt, lots of legal work under your belt. And so I wanted people to know more about you before we get into our topic about court reform, Supreme Court reform particularly. But can you please speak a little bit about yourself, where you are, where you practice, and uh, let people get to know you? I'm happy to do that. Uh, you mentioned uh, mediation, and uh, I really uh, got into mediation because uh, prior to going to law school, actually, I was uh, in the investment business for about six years back in the 1980s. And so I was very familiar with the financial services industry, and I did some, early on in my career I, as a lawyer, I did uh, quite a bit of uh, securities litigation. And uh, for that reason, I became a, a, an arbitrator for what was then called NASD, the National Association of Securities Dealers. It's now called FINRA, the Financial uh, Revolution Authority, the Financial Regulatory Authority, sorry. And it includes uh, mediation and, and arbitration. After that, I... Um, I pursued uh, mediation training and I've mediated securities cases, I've mediated uh, accident cases, I've mediated uh, quite a few domestic relations cases, as you do. And you were yeah. just telling me that you were doing one today. Exactly. I was going, yeah. to, ask, I was going to ask you, how's your week gone? Yeah, no, thanks so much. Um, had a pretty interesting mediation this morning, actually. We just got it settled uh, for temporary orders so i'm very happy and uh, i think those people are happy as well but you know that's my passion these days which is helping people make peace and so it's good to you know hear somebody else who's doing it not particularly in family all the time like i do but also in civil actions and in the business world so what about arbitration tell me what do you do in that regard yes i, I began uh, doing uh, again finra arbitrations securities arbitrations, but uh, since then I have become a, an arbitrator for the uh, American Arbitration Association. Sure. I'm also an arbitrator for the uh, Better Business Bureau, which has, uh, you may know, has a national program for arbitrating disputes over uh, uh, cars that, automobiles that may be subject to the lemon laws in various states and also warranty claims. Uh, so in the arbitration, in the American Arbitration Association uh, realm, I arbitrate virtually every kind of uh, uh, business dispute and consumer dispute. Uh, yeah, so where, where are you based when you're doing all of this? I live in Birmingham, Alabama. Uh, I am also I am uh, licensed in Alabama as well as in Tennessee. You probably know that with uh, arbitration of Disputes that are filed with resolution forums such as FINRA or the American Arbitration Association, or in fact, the Better Business Bureau, arbitrators may actually uh, find themselves arbitrating matters that are between citizens of different states, no. aren't necessarily uh, uh, between citizens of states where those arbitrators practice law, because those are two different things, arbitration. Serving as an arbitrator is not the practice of law. 
Correct. And as you know, and I'm sure you probably tell your parties this every time you mediate a case, you're not practicing law when you're mediating. Uh, exactly. So uh, we can do that uh, in other jurisdictions. Uh, and so some of my cases involve uh, parties from, from all over the country. Uh, I mentioned the Better Business Bureau. A lot of people probably don't realize that the Better Business Bureau has a national program that uh, allows consumers to submit claims to an arbitrator. Yep. Uh, if they have a, a car that they think has been, the dealer has tried to repair too many times or whatever, uh, it's a quick and easy way to resolution of those kinds of disputes. Yes, I remember that when I was doing my arbitration training. I remember the Better Business Bureau coming up quite a bit, actually. Yes, so one of the passions that you have is writing. And I learned earlier that not only are you an attorney and all these other um, legal related fields that you, you work in, but before that, you were an educator. And before that, you what studied English and creative writing. So tell me a little bit about that before we get into the topic of the day, because what we're going to be talking about is a thing you wrote recently on your blog, talking about Supreme Court reform. But tell me about your creative writing, because that's a talent that I, I hope one day to acquire myself. Oh, well, you probably already have the talent, because I know you have uh, the capacity for hard work. I know you work hard as a mediator. Yeah. And um, writing is writing. As I used to tell my students, uh, writing is mostly rewriting. And so <laughs> writing is work. And just like uh, any worthwhile endeavor, you have to, uh, to, to, uh, to work at it. And yeah, I, I uh, finished my Master of Fine Arts in Creative Writing at the University of Alabama in 1982. Um, I have published some short stories and also a novel called uh, Cold Winter Rain, set in Alabama, mostly. It's a, a sort of a hard-boiled detective novel and uh, okay. legal thriller. Uh, the, the main character is a retired lawyer. OK. Interesting. Cold Winter Rain. Thank you for that. I might check it out. And yeah, so lots of similarities. You know, I have a master's in education, and you were an educator, and then licensed in two different states. So lots of different similarities. But with that writing skill, you've you you think a lot about you know our country, our political system, and what works and what doesn't work. So we were talking before the pre-show that you thought a lot about how the Supreme Court of the U.S. should be reimagined. So uh, as you know, and people out there know that it's been a controversial topic, um, the discussion surrounding court packing and whether or not the Supreme Court of the U.S. should change, how many judges should be on it, justices should be on it, um, whether or not certain individuals, individual justices are um, have too much clout than they should, are um, you know, committing certain improprieties they should not. And recently, just this summer, um, back in July, in the US Congress, people were putting forth bills to try to impeach you know, one particular justice, for example, um, Justice Clarence Thomas. And so this is a hot button issue because the Supreme Court is always, these days, especially on people's minds, especially during a presidential election year. And what, you have done is wrote on your blog and i'll share my screen so people can take a look at it if they want to read it gregorylawfirm.us is your law firm website but on the forward slash blog page where you write you've written an article back on july 11th called a modest proposal for supreme court reform and I read it, very interesting. And so that's what we're here to talk about today is to give people the, I guess, audiobook version, you know, between you and me and uh, talk to people, why do we need to reform the Supreme Court? What is the problem with the lack of diversity and what is your solution? 
as to how the court should be changed. But let me uh, give you the floor. So tell us what problem exists. Why do we even need to have this discussion to begin things? I love a word you used in that introduction, Mac, and the word was reimagining. Mm -hmm. I think there are so many things in uh, so many parts of our government structure that could be reimagined for modern times when uh, uh, the uh, Constitution was drafted. Article three is the article of the Constitution that that uh, creates the courts. But at that time, the United States was a, uh, an entity that was primarily, well, was all on the East Coast, and had, what, 15 million people. Yeah. Um, it served a very different population and uh, very different kinds of disputes. Uh, at that time, uh, as I recall, there were only six justices on the court. The number of justices has been changed from time to time. It hasn't always been nine. It's been six, it's been seven, it's now nine. Some have proposed that it be expanded to 13. Uh, my view of just expanding the court, uh, sometimes that has been called court packing uh, by those who want to use uh, uh, a negative term for it. Um, but it's my view that that sort of, um, change is not enough and uh, isn't a re really a reimagining, isn't uh, a restructuring that I think we need on the Supreme Court. I think one of the difficulties we have today with the court, and you mentioned some of them, mm -hmm. is that we have far too much focus on each individual justice. And this focus, there are only nine of them, has led to um, some, let us say, potential improprieties uh, on the court. You mentioned uh, an art articles of impeachment for Justice Thomas. Yeah. We all know that, uh, because we've been told in the media so many times, but Justice Thomas has accepted trips from uh, and other, uh, other uh, gifts from one of your fellow Texans, a man named Harlan Crow, um, a very wealthy businessman who has from time to time matters that come before the court, either through his businesses or otherwise. Uh, and uh, I, what I want to try to do is to remove some of that focus on individual justices through a restructuring, a reimagining of how the Supreme Court works. Yeah. So before we get to the solution, your proposal, why don't we talk about more of the problem? You mentioned in your article this lack of diversity, that one of the problems we've, we have first off is that all current nine Supreme Court justices are kind of models of each other. They all are from the same geographic area. They all believe the same kind of things. And they don't represent the true American people in terms of diversity. Can you go um, down and explain some ways there is a lack of diversity in the court and how that's a problem? Thank you, yes. Uh, one of the startling lacks of diversity on the court is that they are all from the same geographic area in the United States, more or less. They are all from the Northeast. And uh, they attended more or less similar institutions uh, from uh, the time they first started going to school through law school. And speaking of law school, there are, up until Amy Coney Barrett was nominated and uh, to the court, all of the justices for many, many years had been either Harvard or Yale law school graduates, Ivy League law school graduates. Uh, Amy Barrett is a is a Notre Dame Law School graduate, and she was a professor at Notre Dame as well, as you yeah. probably know, before she was nominated to the court. Uh, another way in which they are not so diverse is religious. And that stems, as we all know, from uh, a case called Roe versus Wade and from the controversy over the issue of abortion. Uh, 
Um, that's a very political issue, of course, and it has led to supreme. Uh, it has led to presidents appointing justices who support either one view or the other. And that, oddly enough, you have to think through this, but oddly enough, that has led to the fact that there are no Protestants really on the court, and there haven't been for a long time. And of course, there are no uh, people from other uh, viewpoints, religious viewpoints. There are no Islamic justices. There are no Buddhist justices. But particularly, there are no Protestant justices, even though that's uh, uh, probably 50% uh, at least of the American public. Yeah. Uh, so uh, Republican pre presidents have tended to nominate Catholics because of the institutional uh, opposition to abortion in the Catholic Church, mm -hmm. while, while Democrats have tended to appoint Jews. And so at the moment, we have Catholics and Jews on the court. Yeah. Um, and um, I, it's, my, it's just my view that that can't be particularly, or is it particularly healthy, and doesn't just doesn't reflect the uh, composition, the religious composition of the American people. Yeah, I think a lot of people don't stop to think about that, um, especially the fact that there are no Protestants. I didn't think about it, not even with uh, Katandra Brown Jackson, who got recently appointed. I'm not sure what her um, religious background is or her affili affiliation, but um, yeah, mm -hmm. I, I didn't notice it either. She is she is actually a sort of non-denominational Protestant. She's of course the most recent, the yep. most recent appointee, and she um, says that she's a non-denominational non Protestant. I think, and uh, so uh, there is there is that. Yeah. So in the ge geography, you know, thing stood out to me the fact that most of these folks are in the northeast of the U.S. and that's where they hail from. Um, so in if there's nobody from Texas or California on the court, then sure. The question is how, how well will they really know what our lives are like? And, or like you said, Montana or Hawaii, even, you know, there's, there's just a sort of lack of diversity there. Okay. So we have lack of diversity. There's a big focus on individual justices that there probably shouldn't be, especially when that wasn't the big, um, point at the time of the founding of the nation. But now here we are with television, social media, justices taking trips, um, you know, being interviewed. Um, we have a problem, you know, from your perspective. So now what is the solution uh, to not use that dirty word court packing? What is a way you'd reimagine how the court should look like where we still keep the integrity of the Supreme Court as it was originally you know, envisioned to be a third branch of government that's going to be equal to the other two. So without without losing the value of the court, because we need the rule of law, but without having all the entanglements and all the negatives that come with it. So what's your proposal? My proposal is, is that, as you know, we have uh, 13 circuit courts. That's the intermediate level of appeal, the intermediate level of court, the first level of appeal in the federal system. And so the, the Ninth Circuit is by far the largest uh, of the circuits. I believe it now has 30 or so uh, judges. And I think uh, the smallest has six. There's a quite, a, quite, a, quite a disparity among in the size of the circuits. So it's not very controversial to consider splitting the Ninth Circuit into two or three circuits. And in fact, it has actually been proposed. And there you see it, even geographically, yeah. even geographically, it's very large. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm a nerd, so I need to see this visually. And hopefully anybody out there who's trying to get an education on this can follow along. But yeah, I, I, I don't really do much uh, federal work. And so I'm mainly in this, at the state level. But yeah, in the U.S., we have a circuit court system, and I used to live in the 11th Circuit when I used to live in South Florida. 
And cool. now I do most of my work while living in the Fifth Circuit in, in the Houston area. But yeah, go ahead. Exactly. Uh, and, and you can see how small the First Circuit is. Yeah. It's uh, essentially the northeast corner of the United States, yeah. while uh, the Ninth Circuit encompasses uh, much of the West. Um, and so it would be, uh, I don't think it's controversial to consider splitting that circuit into two or three different courts. And, and in fact, there have been proposals in Congress to do just that. I think there is one pending even now. So mm -hmm. my idea would be to have, instead of 13 courts, uh, you would have 15 courts, circuit courts, and then from there, that is conducive to appointing three of those judges from each of those circuits to serve on the Supreme Court so that you would have a total of 45 just justices on the Supreme Court. Now, that seems like a huge step to go from nine to 45. Yeah. That's five times as many. Correct. But... Um, if you think about, I like to think about this, I like to think about what does a justice of the Supreme Court today, what are they thinking about when they are driving into work in the morning? Mm -hmm. <laughs> what are they doing? What do they do every day? Uh, what's on their minds? Well, they, we all know that they issue 70 or, or 80 opinions every year. But they receive nine or ten or even eleven thousand wow. uh, petitions for rid of certiorari, cert petitions, uh, as lawyers call them. Yep. And they have to, somebody has to decide which of the cases to accept. That seems like an awful lot of work for nine justices to me. Yep. Uh, so one of the things that could happen is if we expanded the court, as I talk about is that uh, some of that work uh, could be divided among more judges, but we also might see the Supreme Court accepting more cases and perhaps accepting cases that aren't just on social or, or cultural or political issues. It seems like so many of the cases that they accept and write opinions on these days are by nature controversial because they are political cases or they are social or cultural cases uh, yeah, so to make sure I, i'm sorry to make sure i understand the first part is creating 15 circuits and each one would have rotating three judges each right. each three would be appointed by the president like by the constitution right and i i'm quite not clear about how frequent the rotations are going to be, be happening. Uh, yeah, but, as well as I recall, I, I suggest that ro rotating them every five years. Got it. Okay. So okay. that uh, uh, ju judges or justices are appointed to the Supreme Court, and then they just rotate back to their circuit court and continue to serve on that circuit court for their lifetime appointment. Uh, okay. I'm, sure you, I'm sure you've seen proposals to... Uh, to impose term limits correct on the supreme court and and on other federal courts well unfortunately the, the constitution uh is an impediment to that because the constitution provides that federal judges uh serve uh during good behavior yeah is the phrase and that's been interpreted to mean for life got it so lifetime appointment also their pay cannot be decreased that's right correct. and so so you're still keeping the guts of article 3 court intact all you're doing is changing the number in a massive way so this is, can't even be seen as what fdr was trying to do back in the what post um new deal era right that's this right. is a complete reimagination of it go ahead that's right what fdr was trying to do was to Put enough judges on the court who would pass, who would, uh, uh, who would, who would find his New Deal legislation to be constitutional. Um, but uh, with the, also with the larger number of justices, they would serve in panels on each case that they consider, yep. uh, just as the just as the circuit courts do today. 
you know right. that the circuit courts meet in panels, panels of three, um, and uh, those panels do the work of the court. But the sort of the magic of that at the circuit court level is a litigant doesn't know which judges are going to be on his panel. Um, they are they are drawn uh, randomly, just as uh, as you mentioned when we were talking earlier. The trial judges in the federal courts are assigned randomly to new cases as they come up. Yep. So, so that prevents a parties from influencing those judges ahead of time uh, because you don't know who the judges are going to be. Yeah. With our nine judges today, we know who they're going to be. Correct. Yeah, so you have 300 million people potentially trying to um, put pressure on nine individuals. Now you'd be spreading this out and the people are still going to serve, but even though they have lifetime, they're only going to be serving for five years at a time. They're still going to be appointed by the president, like the Constitution says. Their pay is still not going to be changed. Although, would that be changed? I I'm guessing... It's an, be... it's an interesting question, pay, yeah. for, pay for, for judges. As you know, another issue, uh, in addition to the, the, the lavish trips and other uh, emoluments of uh, being friends with someone like Harlan Crow, uh, Supreme Court judges write books, they give lectures. Yeah. Some of them earn quite a bit of outside income. Mm -hmm. That that concerns me a little bit. I'm not really sure that it means that they are in any way biased, but I don't think it would be a bad idea to increase the pay of Supreme Court justice, justices and federal judges in general. I don't even think, and when I say this to people, most people are, are uh, very opposed to this. I don't even think it would be a bad idea to increase the pay of senators and members of the House of Representatives because... Uh, they're really not paid all that much considering the fact that you have to have two houses, you have to live mm -hmm. in Washington, D.C., which is one of the most expensive, expensive. cities in yeah. the world. Yeah, and, I got family there, yes, I know. Yeah, so, uh, you know, c considering that, what they're paid really isn't all that much. Gotcha. Yeah, I don't think you get much uh, support that, you know, from the, from the populace on that one. But... Well, <laughs> exactly. But okay, so what about the downsides? I was thinking, uh, would this invite more corruption, meaning human beings being who they are? Um, corruption, both from, you know, regular citizens trying to influence these 45, um, or corruptions where people will, I guess, buy themselves a Supreme Court seat. Is that something that's more possible to get it from a president? Well, it is possible. Uh, today, of course, we know that judges, federal judges, are first politicians. That's yeah. how they come to the to the uh, attention of, uh, of, uh, of the president. The president appoints not just Supreme Court justices, but all judges in the federal system. Typically, what happens, as you know, at the local, at the state level, is that uh, in the federal district courts, uh, in order to be appointed to a position as a federal judge in the federal district court, you probably have to have the ear, have to have the attention of one of the senators or both of them uh, in your state. That's practically exactly you know how it works. And so, is corruption a, a potential problem? Yes, it is, but it is today too. So. Um, I'd, I'd be happy to see a little more oversight. And something we haven't talked about, of course, is the fact that the Supreme Court today has only a voluntary uh, mm. uh, ethics guidelines, mm. unlike the other uh, federal courts, which have mandatory ethics guidelines. So it would not be a bad idea, I think, to have mandatory ethics guidelines for Supreme Court justice justices as well. Yeah. Well, so the whole story of the Supreme Court, you know, is an interesting one because ever since law school, um, you know, ever since Mad uh, Marbury versus Madison, 
right? Where the Supreme Court basically gets a final say. They get to determine what the law is, what the truth is. And I was thinking, could they slam this idea down? Because Congress has a lot of power. They ultimately are the ones who make decisions about how the Supreme Court is to operate, how it's supposed to be divided, where it's supposed to be located. Congress ultimately has all this power. Um, but from what I've always gathered, um, we've never, you know, breached that. We've always kind of seen, we've accepted the nine justices model. It's what we've always known. It's, it's, it, and it sounds controversial. Even to me at first reading, it sounds controversial, you know, what you're proposing, but, um, how would you get um, Americans, I guess, on board? Um, is it that things need to get worse before they get better or, and then, does this model exist anywhere else? Like, how do we know it might work? That is a good question. Uh, how do we get other people on board? How do we get the American people on board? Well, you know, one of the ways we can do that is to talk about how the court is not so functional right now. It's a little bit, in my opinion, dysfunctional. And uh, I think sort of everyone recognizes that. And uh you ask if other countries have this model. Other countries have all sorts of models. Mm. And uh, I can't tell you a specific uh, example at the moment, but I'm glad you asked because that's something I want to look at. Yeah. I do think, though, that other, that other countries have more, have larger Supreme Court or ultimate, if they don't, whether they call it a Supreme Court or not, ultimate decision makers. Yeah. Well, you know, like I said before the pre show, um, you know, I'm, I'm from a country where we've had a very deep history of corruption at, at, at the top. And that's influenced my political thinking. And I always believe that power should not be concentrated um, whenever possible because that can lead to really bad things, especially where it's only a few people making decisions for millions of people. So I'm definitely open to a proposal that's going to spread power more, right? The reason we have, you know, not a, you know, the reason we have a three um, branch government is because we wanted to do a, you know, separate but equal kind of thing to spread it out so that it didn't get concentrated in the hands of a, of a monarch like they had in England. And so there's benefits to diluting it while keeping it still intact and giving leg legitimacy. And so perhaps the way to go is, as you're proposing, going from 9 to 45 and then focusing more on the court itself and not the individuals. But definitely I wanted to give you the time to kind of explain and help flesh this out so that people can understand you know, this reimagination. So last thing, tell us about why the title, A Modest Proposal. Oh, yes. Well, it's a... You mentioned uh, we talked about uh, undergraduate majors and that sort of thing. Uh, yeah. Uh, and uh, uh, Swift has a, a, a wrote an article called "A Modest Proposal," just called "A Modest Proposal," yeah. in which he suggested that uh, that the uh, that the way to resolve the problem of poverty and hunger and starving children. Um, in on the British Isle in the British Isles at that time was to uh, eat the children. <laughs> of course, a tongue in cheek uh, yeah. suggestion. Um, my modest proposal is maybe not so tongue in cheek. I'm not wedded to 45. Yeah. You know, 30 might also work. Got it. Got it. Got it. So Definitely an interesting conversation. Thank you so much. So that if people want to get in touch with you and follow you and um, where, what's the best way they can stay in contact and reach out to you? Well, my website, which you have mentioned, is yep. gregorylawfirm.us. My uh, my email address is uh, can be easily found on the website. Awesome. All right, Stephen Gregory, thank you so much for the chat today. And I look forward to a hearing more from you again, um, I'll keep following your blog posts. And I understand you might be coming up with your own um, podcast it's pretty soon as well, right? We're working on it. It's a nascent podcast, not okay. anything like as mature as yours, but we're working on it. Oh, thank you. Yeah, well, definitely looking 
forward to having more voices on these topics. All right, Stephen, thank you so much. But everyone, thanks so much for tuning in. Until next time, check everything out on lmipodcast.com and on the YouTube channel. All right, take care, everybody. Thanks, Mark.